By ranking fourth among all NBA teams in defensive rating, the Knicks secured home court advantage in the first round. Conversely, they ranked down at number 22 in offensive rating. The acquisitions of Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier give the Knicks two 17-plus point-per-game scores for Coach Tom Thibodeau to work with. However, they did lose their best spot-up shooter in Reggie Bullock, who went to Dallas, plus Walker and Fournier aren't the best on defense. But what other factors will lead to whether or not the Knicks will be any better in 21-22? That and more is on its way. Over three quarters of this channel's viewers aren't subscribed, so if you haven't already and enjoy my content, help me get to 50k by subscribing. Also, hit thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Now let's get into this. In addition to Kemba and Fournier, New York's also getting back an elite shot blocker in Mitchell Robinson. Maybe that'll help New York's chances in the playoffs because last spring against Trey Young, they got torn apart. The Hawks laid a five-game series smackdown on the Knicks, spoiling the franchise's return to the playoffs after seven losing seasons. RJ Barrett and the most improved player of the year, Julius Randle, established themselves as the two main offensive contributors throughout the year. Barrett's defense was elite in 2021 as he ranked directly behind Donovan Mitchell as the fifth most valuable defender at the shooting guard spot. Only thing is, the Knicks lost the man who ranked as the sixth most valuable defender at the two guard in Reggie Bullock. Putting the advanced stats aside, RJ's combination of size, lateral quickness, and wingspan is extremely bothersome for attacking guards. While Julius Randle deserved the MIP, in my opinion, Barrett didn't get the attention he deserved for leading New York to the fourth seed. The man shot 40% from three-point range on four attempts from out there per night, and most impressively, played in all 72 games. Sophomore averages of 18, 6, and 3 are pretty damn good, especially considering he set career highs across the board. Only problem is, Barrett's numbers fell off in the postseason, but luckily for him, a lot of the blame fell on Julius Randle, who was far worse. Randle committed five turnovers per game and shot under 30% from the field. Something ain't right. Something ain't right. And damn it, it's time that we find out. At times, Randle let his emotions get the best of him, but his main problem was that he got the playoff number one option treatment from the opposing team's head coach. Atlanta's pick and roll combination of DeAndre Hunter and Clint Capella proved to be a heavy task, and Nate McMillan made sure that two to three defenders were watching Randall at all times. 90% of players in the NBA aren't skilled enough or mentally strong enough to withstand the playoff number one option treatment, but just because he failed in his playoff debut, it was only Randall's first go around. Now that he knows what it's like dealing with the intensified environments and defensive pressure that the postseason provides, he should make much better reads in 2022. I'd relate Randall's first playoff appearance to watching one of my favorite players in DeMar DeRozan struggle early on in his playoff career in Toronto. Comparing the stats in both DeRozan and Randall's first playoff appearance, and Julius was certainly at a disadvantage, as in his first three playoff games against the Hawks, Randall's 24.1% effort on 54 shots was the worst by any player since 1954. His co-star RJ Barrett was only a second year player in his first playoff appearance, but his points per game and efficiency fell off as well. Similarly to New York fans, based off this audio from Tom Thibodeau, he wasn't too pleased either. I fucking had enough of both of you. You let that fucking team down. Luckily, after the 2021 season, Julius and RJ now have one of the best spot-up shooters in basketball next to them. Evan Fournier shot a blistering 66% on catch-and-shoot three-point attempts last year. That floor spacing will be extremely valuable next to Randall, given Julius was mauled by defensive game planning last year. Fournier is also very solid at creating shots in the pick and roll, and is underratedly quick at getting to the rim. That ability should relieve a lot of the playmaking responsibility that fell to Barrett last year. The only issue with Fournier is that he's a defensive liability. He struggles sticking with his matchup in space and often gets lost guarding pick and roll sets. The Brooklyn Nets played whoever offense on him in their first round series against Boston as KD, Kyrie, and Harden lit the Frenchman up. 
Fournier ranked down at number 26 in defensive real plus minus among two guards, but given the abundance of perimeter defenders the Knicks have with three above average guard defenders with at least a six foot 10 wingspan in Barrett along with Frank Nilakina and Emmanuel Quickly, Fournier's kind of the perfect fit for New York. Maybe you'll have to take him off in crunch time, but here's why picking up Fournier was an underrated deal. I initially graded this as a C because of his bad defense. However, when looking at the Knicks pieces in place, I'm thinking the Knicks signing Evan for four years and 78 million was more like a B, B plus deal. The Knicks can't rank in the bottom eight among teams in offensive rating like they did last season if they expect to make it further than round one. They need as much scoring as they can get. Adding Cardiac Kemba as well for just six million was a steal of an acquisition in which I gave an A plus in my gradings video and I'm sticking with that. Walker may have struggled with the Celtics last year, but he's still a spark plug who can lighten up the scoring load for RJ and Julius. Like Fournier, he's below average on the other end of the floor, but the seven foot one wingspan and overall IQ of Nilakina, who will be Kemba's backup, should cover up his defensive weaknesses. Speaking of defense, the block nest monster and Mitchell Robinson, who set the NBA record for field goal percentage two years ago, is set to return in the 21-22 season. New York announced Robinson underwent successful surgery to repair a fractured fifth metatarsal in his right foot, which doesn't sound great. Given he shot 74.2% from the field in 2019-20 and was second behind Miles Turner in blocks per game the season before that, the Knicks desperately missed Mitchell's elite two-way production last year. If he can recover swiftly from his recent setback, he could make a big time impact on the Knicks building off their breakout season in 2021. Perhaps the main influence on New York taking another step forward is whether or not Tom Thibodeau can scheme well enough offensively. We saw Tibbs establish a preached upon defensive culture in his first Knicks season. Now Tom's got to show that he can adequately mix Kemba and Fournier into the fold. But to get the most out of the near elite bucket getters they have, Tom may have to rely on an offensive coordinator. That may be best given Tibbs has made his bread and butter off turning around teams on the opposite end. Overall, the two backcourt pieces that New York acquired should mesh together and fit in well with the roster in place. Fournier can create, but he doesn't need the ball in his hands to thrive. Walker is a high volume guard, which RJ Barrett shouldn't have too much of a problem with, given he likes to spot up, catch passes off pin downs, and cut back door to the rim. Fournier shouldn't have a problem with that either, as he led the league in spot up three point percentage last year. Looking at this objectively, the Knicks had one of the better off seasons of any team in basketball, and are now in a position to get to the second round or potentially further in 2022. But what do you think of the Knicks pickups and can they build off what they did in 2021? Comment your take down below. You're the best for sticking around. Hope you have a great day. DFlow signing off.